All right, um, turn with me to Romans 8. The information we're covering here today and last night and today is, and I understand it's a lot of things. The beautiful thing about going through this material is you, you hear it, you, can, you obviously are able to go online and go and look at Grace Life Bible Church um, YouTube channel and go re-watch it if you need to. But it's for us to go home and take this information and think about it, you know, and, and, and go through these scriptures and read it over and over and think about what we've heard and to search the scriptures whether these things are so. You know, we are not, you know, I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm asking you actually to to think of me that I could be lying to you, you need to check what the, what the Scripture says rather, you know, and go back to the Word of God and make sure that you understand it and that you don't, you don't become somebody that just regurgitates what I am saying, but you come to the understanding or what Brian is saying or what um, Craig is saying, but you are somebody that, that has come to the understanding of God's Word. And, you, and we, we all can come to the understanding. And we, can, all come, we do come to the understanding and we can come to the understanding. And I'm so thankful that we have the Spirit. You know, we have the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God in us. We are in the Spirit. We are led of the Spirit. Whether we like it or not, we are. Okay? And so, that's what we're going to talk about. We're talking about the hope of the Spirit. That you just it's, the, the wonderful thing is, is that what God has made us to be in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through His death, burial, and resurrection, He's given us, we have the Spirit. We are led of the Spirit. We have the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ in us. Because if, if we don't have the Spirit of God, we are none of His. But we are His because we are in Christ, okay? And that the wonderful thing is what God is doing is what God begins, He's going to complete. And we're never alone. We're ne it's never up to ourselves. God is always going to be making intercession for us by the Spirit. Always. And we're going to see what the Bible says here in, 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 in this passage of, in Romans chapter 8. Um, we are in Christ. We are in the Spirit. But we're going to look through these passages. Let's go read Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The Bible is very clear. He says, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Is there any condemnation for anybody in Christ Jesus? No, there is no condemnation the, who, who walk not is uh, condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. The fact is, there is no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus, but there is condemnation for them who walk after the flesh and not after the spirit. The condemnation he's talking about here is not the issue of eternal salvation. This is not an eternal salvation uh, 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 verse here in the sense of, you know, you can be condemned. To damnation. That's not what a verse is saying. If you're going to choose to act, if you're going to choose to believe and follow the flesh, what you're going to come to find, as we've seen through this, you are going to, if you choose to, to dig up that old man, put him on you, and to live like you have an old man still with you, and if you're going to uh, choose to go take the, the law that was nailed to the cross that God took out of the way, and you go up to that cross and you take that law back and you start applying to you and by your flesh start serving God with that perspective of a performance, what are you going to be? You're going to condemn yourself because you're going to find continuously over and over, I'm, coming, I'm not doing what I should be doing, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm struggling. So what is the victory? What is, how do we have the victory over this then? How do we conquer this is to walk after the what? Spirit. That's what we have to do. We have to walk after the Spirit and to be led of the Spirit of God. We, you and I cannot lose our eternal salvation. We are eternally secure until the day of redemption. You all should be jumping up and say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, let's have a light charismatic service here right now. Because that's what, we cannot lose that. We are secure in that. And we have the Spirit of God. We're going to come to the conclusion. You know, the only, we, we, you have to have the mindset, I have the Spirit of God. You have to renew your mind. We have to remind, I have the Spirit of God. I am walking after the Spirit, not after the flesh. That's who I am. 
I have a new identity. That's what God made me to be. We are not under the law. We are under what? Under grace. And so my principle of my operating in my life is not going to be by the law because the law did only one thing for me. It makes me guilty. And my flesh and the law, all the law or the law anything does is accentuate the, 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 the sin in my flesh. So why would I want to operate under a system like that? No, I have to have a new mindset. I am led of the Spirit. I am in Christ. Okay? We're not in the flesh, but we're in the Spirit. I need to, we need to stand up here when we get to verse 9 in Romans chapter 8. Stand up here and continuously say, but we are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. But we are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. But we are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. You understand what I'm saying? You have to believe that. That's who you are, because you're in Christ. That's who God has made us to be. You cannot look at your life by looking at your flesh. You cannot be looking at your life by following your flesh. You're going to come short. It's going to be miserable. There's no peace. There's no life in that. Life and peace is, I'm in the Spirit. I'm in Christ. Okay? The proof was point. The point was proof as, as Brian was finishing it off. He says, O wretched man, verse 24 of chapter 7, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So I'm going to come to the conclusion what I need to serve God is with my mind. Because if I'm going to try to do it with the flesh, I'm just going to accentuate flesh and the sin. We've got to give you, that's going to be the mind. We have, the Bible says, the mind of Christ. Our inward man is renewed day by day. What we're going to see in this passage in Romans chapter 8 is that God, when you and I are struggling with it, God is making intercession for us. And He's always going to do it according to what He's created us to be in His Son. It's always going to be according to His will, according to the will of God's Word. That's the intercession God makes for me all the time. Now sometimes I'm so absent-minded of that because I'm so busy with my flesh. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that God does not make intercession for me. He's always doing that. Because when you're struggling, like, oh, I can't do what I want to do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. It's so frustrating. This flesh, this flesh, this flesh. God makes intercession for us according to His will, according to His word, according to what He has created us to be in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to His purpose. You've got to believe that. We've got to renew our minds in understanding what God is doing for us. If God be for us, who can be against us? There's nothing that can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That needs to be my mindset on a continuous basis. That's being led of the Spirit. And I've got to get into this. Otherwise, I'm going to let this stuff, this flesh of mine, my, 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 my body, and the just the, the residual things of that, the defaults, Magic course, and I don't want to. I want our defaults to be overridden by new defaults. Defaults that's stronger, more power, that's mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That I can be, have a victory over sin because I have it. Sin has no longer dominion over me. There is therefore now no condemnation for them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh. In Romans chapter 8 verse 1 to 4, he is summarizing, summarizing what he've just said in the last couple of passages, chapters. For there is, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. If I've been made free from the law of sin and death, why do I want to go to that cross, take that law that I could not keep, that I could not do, the things that was against me and contrary to me, take it off the cross and say, I'm going to try and apply these principles in my life. No, no, no. I've got to apply the principles of the finished work of Christ. That is the law of the Spirit of life in Christ. What if just summarized to us in the first seven chapters here, for, that, for, for, for what the law could not do, 
And it was weak through the what? There's absolutely nothing, nothing wrong with the law of God. It's holy, it's perfect, it's righteous. But the problem is, you and I have a what? A flesh. And that, while we have this flesh, this unrede un unredeemed flesh, it's not profitable for me to go back to the law. He says, for what the law could not do, and it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Is your, sin con is your flesh condemned? The sin in your flesh condemned? Yes or yes? According to this verse, it is. Because that's what Christ did for us. He was making a likeness of sinfulness and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he, For He was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made, might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the what? When Paul says, for I delight in verse 22 of chapter 7, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Verse 4 of chapter 8 says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Where is it fulfilled in us? In Christ. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's fulfilled in Christ. Not in my flesh, because in my flesh, ah, the law is just going to make me guilty, make me more sinful, accentuate, I do all that. We walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's who we are. We have a new law operating in us. In verse 2, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And the renewed mind comes to understand that what He's done for us. I know that I died with Him. I know that I buried with Him. I know that I've risen with Him and resurrected with Him. I know that I'm alive unto God, and I can now uh, 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 yield my members and instruments of righteousness. I know that because of the finished work of Christ and identification I have in Him. That's my new law operating in me. It's made me free from that. Old laws nailed to the cross. Operates in the members. It's weak through the flesh. But God sent His Son. In chapter 8 of verse 32, chapter 8 verse 32 there, of Romans chapter 8 verse 32 says, He that spared not His own Son but deliver him up for us all. How shall not with him also freely give us all things? Will he freely give us all things? Yes. Is there anything that can separate me from his love because of his son that he offered up for us? No. That mindset, that renewing of my mind concerning these truths, oh man, should be such should be formed so much and formulated so much in my, in my physical, in my, in my body, so that I can yield my members as instruments of righteousness. So that it can, it can, it can give me a life of, of not condemnation. I don't have to go through life and say, oh, Des, oh, Des, you messed up, you messed up, you messed up. But to come and say, you know, I have, I have life in the Spirit. Because, you know... How much peace is therein? How much peace is in the fact if you start, if you continuously say, oh, you're just messing up all the time, you're just miserable all the time, and you start focusing on in your flesh, I just cannot do the things I want, you're just so miserable. How much life and peace is in that? It's miserable, man, to live like that. And so that's why we have to be renewed in the spirit of our minds with these truths that we're learning here. And get away from the things that accused us. Because we've already been positionally in Christ Jesus. He has already cleared us from that stuff. We just make the choice to not to be cleared of it. The rearing of the mind clears us from that. He sent His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for us to condemn, condemn sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 5 says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, interesting, he's bringing up this argument here, and he's bringing himself, they, 
that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. So now we say, oh, well, if I'm after the flesh, do mind the things of the flesh? Hmm. But they that after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now may I ask you, what is this new mind that's in us? The mind that he saw serves the law of God with. Is that life and peace? Is this a life of, of, of righteousness? Is that what God's purpose and plan is? Yes. I am not carnally minded. No, I can do carnal things. But the mind that I have in me is the mind of who? Of Christ. I have to see myself that how God the Father, when God the Father looks at me, or at Brian, or at Craig, or at any one of us here, how does He see us? He sees me in His Son, perfect, holy, righteous, complete, accepted. All these things that He's made me to be. And He sees me like that. And so I have to learn to look at myself like that. Not just me, but I need to look. And this is the hardest part. I need to look at you in the same way. Because I want to look at you at your performance of your flesh. And when I look at you at the performance of your flesh, I get miserable. Do not edifying me. But i got to look at you from the way that God the Father sees you. And you. And you. In His Son. And I have to continuously renew my mind on that. And so when I start looking at you that way, I will act towards you like God the Father would act towards you. Not how like my carnal and sinful flesh is going to act towards you. Because my pride that's in my flesh and my selfishness in my flesh is always going to make you want to look you lesser than me. And it's always going to evaluate, uh, evala, um, elevate me instead of you. It's going to edify me and not you. That's what I'm doing. That's what pride does. That's what the flesh does. Why would I want to look at you like that? I want to look at you the way that the Father sees you and deal with you the way the Father deals with you. And meekness with grace, long suffering, patience. And that's the hard thing. After I beat myself up, I just want to beat you up too. Where's life and peace in a life like that? There's none. It's miserable. You go to church, you preach a message, you get in the car, you ride home, you say to your wife, those bunch of suckers in that church, you know, they just frustrate me. So and so was just looking at that, not paying attention to me, and I'm all dwelling on the negative, negative things because my flesh was not happy how you performed when I was preaching. And I spend my time riding home for the next hour, negatively talking about the body of Christ. Can you see how that formulates new patterns in my brain, which is of the flesh and not of the spirit? We love to beat other people up. God doesn't love to beat us up. You know what God does for us? He gave us life in His Son, and He sees me in that life. He made me accepted in the beloved. And He loves me unconditionally. Verse 6 says, So we carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is at enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I've been made free from the flesh. The flesh has been crucified. We've put the flesh off. Why do I want to live by the flesh that I cannot please God with instead of living like who God has made me to be, who I am? In the Spirit, not in the flesh. And I need to see myself as in the what? In the Spirit. Verse 9. Verse 8, let's go look at verse 8, chapter 8. <clears throat> so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The fact is, 
Yeah, guys, listen to this. Listen, don't even look at verse eight, not, no, verse nine now, because we're going to get to that now. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You can choose to take that verse and live your life by that verse and say, "You're in the flesh cannot please God." So I'm going to try really hard. That's not the overcoming of it. The overcoming of it is you are not in the flesh. That's not who you are. Stop looking at you as somebody in the flesh. Look at yourself as somebody that's in the what? In the spirit. You're in Christ. You've been made accepted in the beloved. You have His imputed righteousness. You are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight. That's who He made you to be. Now, let me tell you something. I know that. I know that information. I see it in the scripture. And, and let me tell you, I believe it. But sometimes I'm like, hmm, don't. I don't look at myself that way because I'm looking for myself from a fleshly point of view instead of from a spirit, spirit point of view. I'm looking for myself not from the God, Father's point of view. I'm looking for myself from what, what? My own point of view, my flesh point of view. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. What I need to do with my flesh, I need to mortify the deeds of the flesh. And I can do that only by being led of the what? Of the Spirit. The fact is, I can glorify God in this body. But I have to learn through the process of reading of believing, of meditating, of considering who I am. Verse 9. Verse 9. But ye, who's, it, who's ye? He's talking to the body of Christ. He's talking to us. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the what? Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He's not saying if you don't act in the Spirit, you're none of his. What he says, if you have the Spirit of God, which is also the Spirit of who? Of Christ, you are his. Without the Spirit, and if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not his. You're not a believer. But we are believers. We are in Christ. And guess what? We are not in the flesh. We are in the what? In the Spirit. That's who we are. Go to the mirror and look at yourself and says, there's you, not that flesh, you indwelling in there. You're in the Spirit. We spend so much time beautifying our flesh. What do you think of this, you know? Does this look made me good, you know? But we're not focusing on the beauty of and the wonder that God has made us to be in His Son. I don't have to create that. That's been created. That's been done. To do that, He had to get rid of that old man. By the way, that was spiritual. The old man wasn't physical. The old man was a spiritual thing that was put to death. I'm living in a physical body with a residual of that, and I need to look at my spirit in my inner man. That God is renewing day by day. That God is making intercession for day by day. I'm eternally thankful that God sees me in His Son. Amen. I'm eternally thankful that I am in the Spirit. Now, I forget that sometimes, to be honest with you. I live my life sometimes like, hmm, and I want to do it by my flesh, and before I know it, because, we're, you know, we said, we're not under the law. Grace believers, we're not under the law. But let me tell you something. We live our life daily just like we would have been under the law because we place ourselves under a performance-based system. Not under a belief system, but under a performance-based system. And when we do that, we condemn ourselves all the time. Instead of saying, hey, whoa, whoa, stop. You're dead. The old man's crucified. You're dead. Your flesh has also been crucified with his lust and affections. See it from that point of view, from God's point of view. See yourself as somebody, hey, I'm not under the law. I have a new law. It's a law of the life of Christ in Jesus. 
and I especially have it through the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, I understand the full concept of that now. And start looking for myself. I am in the spirit. I'm not in the flesh. Let me tell you. The yielding of our, the yielding of our members, the yielding of this flesh to righteousness, or the members to righteousness, is only going to come. It starts with doctrine. It starts with the teaching of God's word. It starts with a form of doctrine that we have to believe that renews our mind. And then we have the power to do so. That's who we are. Yes, look at verse 10. He says, for, uh, I'm going to get back to 9. He says, well, let's, from, oh, sorry, let's read from verse 9. Why have a mind if you can't change it, right? But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Guess what? The body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of what? So the body is dead because of what? Sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Whose righteousness? What righteousness? The righteousness was by the faith of Christ. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, does He? Yes or yes? He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your what? Mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. So by His Spirit it will quicken our mortal bodies. To quicken something means to do what? To make it alive. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. But if you live after the flesh, you shall, fulfill, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall what? So how do we mortify the deeds of the flesh? By what? By the Spirit. According to that verse. Verses. We have a problem. The problem is our flesh. The, the dealing and the coping with that problem doesn't come from dealing with our flesh from our flesh. The coping with that problem and the dealing with that problem comes from being in the what? Spirit. The Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God in us. That's who we are. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Romans, uh, sorry, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6. And because ye are sons... God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying what? Abba, Father. You and I are sons. We're going to learn just now that we are heirs of God and what? Joint heirs for Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him. That if so be that we suffer Him is not an issue of conditional if. It's an issue of argument. You are sons. You are in the Spirit. You're in Christ. And because you're in Christ, you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. None condition to that. The only condition is you have to be in Christ. You have to be in the Spirit. We are sons, we cry out, Abba, Father. You know the last time in the Scriptures, somebody cried out, Abba, Father. I say, Abba, Father, you say, Abba, Father. Okay? I say, Pastor, you say, Pastor. I don't get it. Okay? Abba, Father. Let's say, Abba, Father. Makes you happy, all right? When is the last time somebody cried out, Abba, Father? Jesus Christ. The night and gets him, and the night he was prayed. The night he was betrayed, he goes to the garden, and he's praying. Abba, Father. He's in such a close relationship with the Father that he says, Abba, Father. That word, Abba, Father, means dearest, daddy, very personal, very 
close. You and I, now, because we are sons, He's put the Spirit, He says, and because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying what? Abba, Father. Wow. The last one that, could, that said Abba, Father, was Jesus Christ Himself. Now you are in Him, and we have the Spirit of His Son in our hearts, and we cry out, Abba, Father. That statement says, now what's that going to do with what you're going to say? I think everything to do with what i got to say, being led of the Spirit. Because if I have that access to God the Father, and I can say to God the Father, the same terminology His Son is used as Abba Father, it makes me a unique, special creature that He's made to be in His Son. To cry out the same words that the Son has cried out. I have to, and, and now... That's part of my identity that I, as a son of God, can cry out, Abba, Father. And guess what? I need to look at myself like I am unique. In the sense of being in Christ, being led of the Spirit, I can cry out the same thing that the Son is, because I'm in the Son. And we need to glorify God in our body and in our spirits, which are God's. You see, you're either an Adam... Or you're in Christ. And if you're in Christ, if we're in Christ, then we are, uh, we are in the Spirit. If we're in Adam, we're none of His. And so I need to look at myself on a continuous, daily basis, in light of what the Scripture says to me, renewing my mind in the light of what God has made me to be. Let me, ask, let me tell you, that's going to be exceedingly beneficial for us and edifying for us to do so. Closing this book when you get home and putting it down there, never looking at it again till next week and Sunday when the preacher says turn to so and so, and then closing that book and not looking at it in the week, and not setting, and it not being renewed in the spirit of our mind by looking at this word, is not going to be beneficial for you. The benefit comes from studying God's word, considering God's word, meditating upon God's word, reading God's word, going over those things over and over and over. And sometimes, you know, what it helps me from a practical standpoint, from, just from a practical point of view, you can't always read God's Word, okay? Because it's not always practical. But, you know, I have sometimes, I have to go somewhere, and it takes me an hour to go there. And I put the, I put the CD in, and I choose to put certain CDs in, you know, of, of Alexander, you know who Alexander Scorby is? He reads the Bible on video, audio and stuff. And I just put that, right, that audio on there sometimes. Not all the time, because sometimes I put 80s rock on it. <gasps> Should have said that. <laughs> and that doesn't renew my mind, okay? It just gets me in the flesh, okay? But none of you do that, okay? I know. It's just me. Um, <clears throat> put that CD in, and I just listen to him reading through the book of Romans. You know how much profit is in that? Just listening to that being read? Because you pick things up that you don't normally, because you start hearing the context of what he's reading. You're not just looking at a verse, you start hearing the context. Whoa, 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 whoa. You want to stop and make a note of it almost. That's why God, what's what God's Word does for us. It renews our minds. And that's just a practical point if you want to do that, you know. My wife and I sat, and this is practical things about renewing your mind, and I may be a little bit off the topic here now, but you don't have my script, what I'm teaching, so that's okay. We read through the, we read through, read through the Bible, the Old Testament chronologically. Okay, we sat every night and did it. And what we did is that help us just to do that, is we put the, the audio on, and we have our Bibles open, and while the audio is reading, we're just following our Bibles. You know what profit there was for us in that? Doing that? Start seeing the context of what's going on? That's why it is important that we read God's Word. Because it, it, it renews our minds. It makes us think spiritual things. Because sometimes you just hear it, and before you know it, you're using spiritual words that in myself, in my own residual brain defaults never would have used those words. And I'm starting using Scripture as it's renewing my mind. God is now working in me. 
Anyway, let's get to the point. Let's go further on. We are led of the Spirit of God. Acts, Acts chapter 8. We are in the Spirit. What did I say? Acts? Yeah, I'm a liar. Romans, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 10 says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwelleth in you. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if we through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, we shall what? Live. There's life and peace. There's life. There's live. living. For as, the, as many as are led of the Spirit of God, they are what? Let me ask you, did we come to the conclusion that we are the sons of God? Yes or yes? yes. So that means I am led of the Spirit, right? Well, sometimes I don't listen, but I am led of the Spirit. For, verse 15 says, Ye have not received the spirit of, of, a, of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry what? Just the point that I was talking about earlier. We cry out, Abba, Father. We cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with my what? With, sorry, with our spirit. That we are the children of God. How am I the children of God? I am not in the flesh, but in the what? In the spirit. I am a child of God. We are, and the spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. In my flesh, sometimes I don't feel like a child of God. But it doesn't, that doesn't mean that I'm not a child of God. I am a child of God because I'm in a child of God because I'm in the spirit. Not because I prove it by my flesh. The Spirit itself beareth with us with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, the conclusion, if children, then what? Heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with who? You and I who are in the Spirit, who have the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, we are in the Spirit, not in the flesh. We are in the Spirit. We are the children of God. And as the children of God, we are heirs of God. And what else do we are? If we are heirs of God, that automatically makes me a joint heir worth what? It's not conditional on the performance of my flesh and what I do in my flesh. It's conditioned on the finished work of Christ that makes me an heir of Christ, or heir with Christ. And I need to start looking at myself with this mindset and the renewing of my mind that I am not just somebody that's in the Spirit, but I'm in the Spirit as Son of God. I'm an heir of God. I'm a joint heir with Christ. I cry out, Abba, Father. Woo! That needs to motivate me for some serious renewed wiring in my brain, which will affect me how I act and love and, and what I say and what I do. Now, it minds that that renewing of my mind is going to do that for me. Without that... I cannot present my body a living sacrifice. I need this doctrine. I need this information to be, bring me to the point that I can now, which is my reasonable service, present my body a living sacrifice. Because my body is not my own now, it's Him. I cannot affect my body by my performance, but I sure can affect my body by being led of the Spirit and mortify the deeds of my flesh. That's the power of God. I can take thoughts captive. I can cast away things that I never had the power to do so because of who I am and what God has made me to be in His Son and my mind being on that. That's not going to happen from digging that old man up and putting him on me. That's not going to happen from... Un Un, un, undoing the law from the cross and try to live by that, it is going to come from inward man being renewed in the spirit of my mind. Minding the things of above, 
And we are debtors, not to the flesh, but to who? To the Spirit. We owe it. And if heirs, if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that this, we suffer with Him. That's who we are. We have the spirit of adoption. That's what we have. You're no more a servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir and a joint heir. That's who we are. Go, with, go to Titus chapter 3. There's so much information here. I'm not making excuses for time or anything like that. I'm still good on time, right? Okay. I'm not making excuses for time, but there is such a wealth of information. You know what? You don't need me. You don't need me to get the wealth out of this. All you need to do is go and look at these verses. Why do you want to wait till next Sunday till Brian preaches a message to get something out of it when you personally have the Spirit of God, can understand the things of God, can be led to the knowledge of this stuff, and then come next Sunday and instead of doing what, just, what am I going to get out of this? No, what I'm going to give to this because what God is doing in me. Because we normally come to church because, what can I get out of church today? Well, it's not giving what I want. No, no. You are a son of God, aren't you? You're a letter of the Spirit, aren't you? You're an heir of God and joint heir with Christ, aren't you? So can you know the things of God? Yeah. Yes, you can. Can you be more than a conqueror through Christ? It's... Yes. Can you learn to obey and abound? And above all these things, just carry on and give thanks and everything? Can you do all things through Christ that strengthen you, whether it's abasing or abounding? That's what the Spirit of God does in us. That's who we are. Our identity is in Christ. And it brings us ultimate glorification. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Now he goes here from, and verse 7 he says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that as we suffer with Him, that we may also, also be glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So he's telling us, he's telling the body of Christ, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, by the way, it's only for those believers that is unfaithful that's suffering in this present time, or is he going to come to the conclusion that all believers are suffering in this present time? Not just believers, but everything. All creation. Every creature. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So if the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, where should my mind be? Not in the sufferings of this present time, right? Because what I need to do is let the sufferings of this present time work for me a far more exceeding eternal weight of what? Glory. I need to focus on the things, on my glorification. I need to see myself as an heir of God and joint heir with Christ in my ultimate glorification. If I'm led of the Spirit, that's my focus. My focus is not the sufferings of this present time. Let me tell you something, we all suffer, and we all suffer in different ways. You're suffering now listening to me through this hour, okay? You better understand it. But we all suffer to some degree. And some sufferings are, not all sufferings are equal. Some people have it harder at other time than others. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, and not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. I don't have time to explain those verses, but let me tell you, the whole creation groaneth in pain. When I say the whole creation, even the, even the beast in the field, complains. Even the beast in the field complain. Joel chapter 1, 18 says, the, <laughs> it says, uh, How do the bees groan? The herds of the cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. The flocks of the sheep are made desolate. There's going to come a time future, not 
at our rap, not at our catching away, but when God brings the kingdom to Israel where they're not going to be perplexed anymore. But until then, we groan and travail in pain. And for us here, he says, verse 20, wait, wait. Verse 22 says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together unto now. Now the question is like, he doesn't ask the question, but there's like, what about us? As children of God, don't we have health, wealth, and prosperity? Yes, we have health, wealth, and prosperity in Christ. In the Spirit. Then he says, verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit of the Spirit. We that are led of the Spirit, we are the first fruit of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to work the redemption of the body. Oh man, until the redemption of my body, until this mortal, corruptible, vile thing that I'm living in is going to be redeemed, until then I groan and travail. But there's a hope that I have, and with patience I can wait for it. Because that's what God is doing in the inner man, to with patience wait for it. There's more victory, there is more victory to learn living with travail and pain and groaning and to be content than for it to be taken away. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Because as we're waiting, it works for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Go for 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 16. Verse 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Times are just about up. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, is it perishing, yes or no? Is it travailing and paining, yes or yes? Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Is it or isn't it not? Is the inward man renewed day by day? The Bible says it, so if it's not, then you have to scratch it out and say it's not. But God said it is. Now do I recognize that always? No, but is it renewed day by day? So my mindset should be it's renewed day by day. Because it's renewed not by me, it's renewed by the Spirit of God. By what God's doing. The inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, what does it do? Which is but for a what? Now does it feel like a moment sometimes for you? Your affliction, your light affliction, does it feel like a moment? No, it feels like an eternity. This will never end. But our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of what? Glory. While we look, this is how it's going to work, while we look not at things which are seen, but at the things that are what? Not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are what? So what wakes for us a far more exceeding is the eternal things. The focus on our ultimate glorification. Until then we groan and travail, until we wait for the redemption of our body. And while we wait for the redemption of our body, my body is still wired to be selfish, wired to be dissatisfied, wired to be angry, wired to be mal It's naturally, it's in there, it's ingrained there, I can't get rid of it. And that's for that reason I need to start seeing myself as being led of the Spirit, that I am in the Spirit, I am in Christ, and that let's start overriding my perception of who I am. Because my perception of who I am is I'm looking at this to see who I am, and it's not who I am. Who I am is who I am in Christ inside. And I need to be renewed in the Spirit of my mind, and that will affect this physical body to cope while I'm waiting for that. And here's the beautiful thing. Here's the beautiful thing. The time's up. The Spirit advocates for truth in our lives. You're not on your own. When every man forsake you, who's going to stand with you? God stands with you. He never will leave you, nor forsake you. He says in Romans chapter 8, he says, 
But uh, verse 24 says, We are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we with hope, but but if we hope for what we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. Now, those passages will renew your mind to have patience and wait for it. Now look at verse 25, verse 26. Likewise, now he says likewise, in the same manner of what he's just said to you here, the Spirit also helpeth our what? Infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is the heart, mind of the Spirit. God searcheth the heart. He knows what's the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to what? The will of God. So as we are dealing with this groanings and travailing, as we're waiting for the redemption of our body, as we're waiting for hope and patiently waiting for that, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. I used to think, I used to teach and think that this passage says that, you know, because of God's Word being in the process of progressively being revealed, I don't know how I ought to pray, but now that I have the completed Word of God, I know exactly how I need to pray. And, and, and because of that, that verse doesn't count anymore. But let me tell you something, that verse very well counts because it's got to do with my identification. It's got to do with God interceding for me. It doesn't nullify, it, 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 I'm struggling, I'm, I'm, I don't, sometimes I don't know how to, my wife was sick a year ago, and I'm like, Lord, I know that you don't intervene and supernaturally intercede and going to miraculously heal her, but how do I pray for her correctly? But God's already done that for me. The Spirit's already interceded according to God's will, His Word, written Word, revealed Word for me already. I'm not on my own. If I'm led of the Spirit, let me tell you something, I'm also being interceded by the Spirit for. That should go like, woohoo! Gives me some, some, some real, in the eyes of the world, strange liberty. You'll have to look for a miracle. There it is. It's in Christ. It's in what God's doing for us. We're never going to be led to be figuring this out by ourselves. He's always going to make intercession for us according to. Because God searched our hearts. He knows what's the mind of the Spirit. Because we are led of the Spirit. Whether we know it or not, we are led of the Spirit. And God and he, his intercession for us, and God knows what's the mind of the Spirit in us. Because He knows what His own mind is. Right. And He's take, making intercession for us. That should rewire and make us rethink how we live and what we are and what He's made us to be. Our time's up. You read the whole rest of the chapters yourself and go through all these things and look at these things. I thank God that, he, that I am not in the flesh, that I'm in the Spirit. I thank God that I'm an heir of Him and a joint heir with His Son. I thank God that I will ultimately be glorified and what I'm going through is not worthy to be compared with what ultimately is going to happen. I thank God that I can with patiently wait for that and the only, the only way I can do it is by His Spirit. It's by the finished work of His Son. It's by His Word that He's given to me. And that He intercedes for me and takes, makes intercession for me when I don't know how to deal with stuff. I don't know to deal with how to deal with all these things. He's always been there standing in for me. And He's doing that according to what God has already revealed and, and, and what God is beginning, He's going to complete. And for Him to complete it, He has to do the work, not me. And for me to have victory over this, what I'm doing right now, I need to constantly put my mind on these things, constantly renew my mind in understanding these things so it can operate in me and override my natural tendency to want to do it in my own strength. But let Him do it. i got to get out of the box and let God, get out of the way and let Christ, God get in and do the work. Father, we thank You for Your full provision, completely full provision, through the finished work of your Son. Thank you for, 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 for leading us by your Spirit. Thank you that there is no condemnation for us that are in Christ Jesus. Thank you that we do walk after the Spirit. Thank you that we are sons, that we are your sons. 
that we are complete in your Son, that we, we are heirs of you and joint heirs with your Son, that we, we, we can look forward to an ultimate glorification. And while we wait for it, that we know that we with patiently and, and, and can wait for it and, that, and that, we, that your Spirit is making intercession for us according to your will. Oh, Father, we thank you for this great work you're doing in us. We praise you for this and we thank you for this by Christ Jesus alone. Amen. Thanks, Des. Well, you've been sitting here for three hours. I would say you've been well fed. I don't mean physically. I obviously mean spiritually. Um, we're going to take a break now for the afternoon. Um, I do encourage all of you and strongly recommend that you uh, find your way back here tonight at 630. Uh, Craig is going to be teaching again at 630 on uh, recognizing and combating deceptive brain messages. And then after that, we're going to have a time of ice cream fellowship here. Um, one thing I wanted to say about the ice cream fellowship, those of you that are going to be here for that, we don't have any scheduled help as far as kitchen help. So um, if you're going to be here, we're just going to ask that everybody kind of pitch in and help with uh, the ice cream uh, fellowship. Right now, uh, we're going to eat lunch. We're going to uh, enjoy some pizza and fellowship. You're free for the afternoon, and we'll be back in here at 6.30. I don't know. I'm planning to be back probably around 6, about a half an hour before we're supposed to start. I'm sure somebody might be at the church before me. I think we're going to put out... We'll probably have some leftover pizza. Uh, probably there's other snacks and stuff that have been left over from the, uh, yet last night and today. We'll probably put some of that stuff out. So if you want to stop and eat dinner or whatever, that's up to you. If you want a recommendation about what to do this afternoon, um, there's people that live locally that can uh, steer you in what you might be interested in doing. Um, so just uh, keep that in mind. And then tomorrow we have uh, two studies tomorrow morning to end the conference. Before we eat lunch, I've asked uh, Todd Smith, uh, one of the elders here at Grace Life Bible Church, if he would mind just uh, leading us in a word of prayer for our meal. And uh, Todd, you want to come on up? And I guess you could have done it from wherever you. Are.